Fine. So I let me start out with the two qu the two questions that are motivating this this conference. Generally speaking, one of them is what is the role of diagrams in mathematical proof? Well, and the other one, well, how are diagrams related to form axiomatic mode, modes of presentation? So I, did, I took these to be two of the questions that are you know being addressed at this at, at this conference, and I'll take these two questions you know as you know two of the questions that I'll be trying to give answers to in my talk. So uh, these are, now I'm going to give you kind of like a, the whole the, the road, right, the map of where we're going. These are the main claims that I'll be defending here. One is that mathematical proof is originally, but inherently, a dialogical notion. So originally you might say, well, you know, okay, there's a historical uh, development in the background, but now it's not anymore a dialogical notion. I want to claim that the origin is still with us. So this dialogical origin, uh, there are still very important biological traces in our current notions of mathematical proof. The other one is that uh, there's this very important move from pure orality to writing, which takes place already in ancient Greek mathematics. And this move to writing gives rise to a hybrid entity, something that is in between orality and writing, and so that's why a proof both is and is not a dialogue. It retains some dialogical features, but at the same time it loses all the dialogical features. And that's why it's kind of an in-between uh, hybrid entity. And then, uh, also I will say that that's related to my previous work, the move from informal written proofs to formal proofs reintroduces a diagrammatic component, but then in a different way, because the proofs themselves, making use of the notation that's specially designed for the purpose of formalizing these proofs, the proofs themselves become diagrams. And that's something else that I'll talk about so, to some, I'll spend some time on this. So I'll start with some historical considerations. As I said, my biological conception of proof is very much inspired by the historical development of uh, the concept of mathematical proof in ancient Greece. Then I'll give you the part on mathematical proof as a dialogical notion. That's the part where half of you can zoom out, right? so that, which will be rehearsing what I said already, some of what I said uh, in October. And then the third part, informal and informal proofs, that's where I'll talk about my previous work on how, how you know, formal, formal proofs, in a sense, become diagrams themselves. Okay? So let's start with the historical considerations. So of course, this is the inevitable picture, I could not possibly not use it. So here's a, a quote ba which basically summarizes everything that I have to say about proofs uh, by Ravi Arnaz. So this book is called uh, The Shaping of Deduction. Uh, Ravi Arnaz is a classicist. He, uh, this was actually based on his PhD work which he did with Jeffrey Lloyd. So for those of you who are a little bit historically inclined, you may have heard of, Jeff of Sir Jeffrey Lloyd. And, uh, and so Raphael really researched very extensively the, the origins of the, of the concept of deductive proof in Greek mathematics. So it's called The Shaping of Deduction. It's really a wonderful book. It's not so new anymore, but nothing has come out in the meantime that's better than that. But, so there's also a, a fairly recent volume, 2012, uh, what is it called? Uh, Conceptions of Proof in Ancient Mathematical Traditions, by, uh, edited by Karin Shemla. And uh, so there are quite a few interesting papers that are also won by Revial and so on. There's a lot of work being done in this direction and it's really fascinating. And also comparative work, right, so proofs in, in ancient Greek mathematics but also in Chinese mathematics, but Roman mathematics. Okay, so here's a quote. Greek mathematics reflects the importance of persuasion. It reflects the role of orality in the use of formulae, in the structure of proofs, and in its reference to an immediately present visual object. But this orality is regimented into a written form where vocabulary is limited, presentations follow a relatively rigid pattern, and the immediate object is transformed into the written diagram, doubly written, for it is now inscribed with letters. It is at once oral and written. Right? So this is really my, that's where I take this idea that you know, proof is both, both is and is not a dialogue. It's really in between orality and writing, and that's the, the title of my talk. So the first, uh, again, and I'm focusing again on the history of these historical developments. There is the question of whether the Greek texts themselves had diagrams. Right? So we have, of course, the texts that we have of classical works like the Elements and others 
are most, for, most, for the most part, they're much later, uh, based on much manuscripts that date sometimes to the medieval times or to uh, late antiquity. So we don't really have texts from back then. Right? And so then we're in this situation where we have to speculate whether the original ta Greek texts themselves had these diagrams or not. Uh, I think most people, most uh, specialists think that there were diagrams. Right? There, were, there, were, there must have been some sort of diagrams accompanying the texts, and one reason to think that is that the text itself underdetermines the proof, right? Just from the text, you don't, you know, it's not clear what exactly the argument is just by itself. But, so, so for the right, so then we have this problem, that, you know, this historical problem, and, and it's, the, the, the situation is, in a sense is even worse than you might think it is, because Many of the critical editions of the classical works, including the elements, what the diagrams that they have, because of course you're going to tell me, oh, you know, if you just look at the standard edition of the elements by Albert, of course the diagrams are there. Yes, they are there, but these are modern diagrams that have been redrawn, uh, uh, you know, at, in this particular case, at the time of the translation, of the translation, of the edition, right? So there's nothing, nothing that tells us that this is what the diagrams look like in the original. So that there is this problem there. And then there is this uh, paper in this chapter in this volume that I was telling you about uh, of uh, uh, conceptions of proof in ancient mathematics, uh, which goes like this. So this, it's really about the, the manuscript tradition for diagrams uh, in, in these uh, classical texts. And it says, manuscript diagrams are historically contingent objects which were read and copied and redrawn many times over the centuries. Right? So even if we have, say, a medieval manuscript of the elements, and there will be diagrams there, then of course nothing uh, guarantees that these were really the diagrams in the original Greek texts. So there are layers and layers of in reinterpretation at every time. So it's a complicated issue, not one to which we can have an answer. You know, possibly we'll never know simply because we don't have the sources. But it's just something that we need to keep in mind. So when you read Euclid and you see that beautiful diagram and you think, oh yeah, that must have been, the, it wasn't, we don't know if it was there or not. We, we don't know what it looked like, okay? But we do, that most people seem to think that there were, there must have been some diagrams in the original text. Okay, so here I have a bit from the famous bit from the Meno where Socrates, uh, proves, uh, shows the slave boy how to double the area of a square. Right? Very famous, uh, very famous passage. It's a dialogue, if you haven't noticed. So here, here he goes. Socrates says, tell me boy, do you know that a figure like this is a square? Right? And you can imagine what's happening in this situation. This drawing, right? a figure, right? So there's sand, and you know, you can think of it in a very romantic way. There's sand, and then they're drawing, and sand. The boy says, I do, of course. He has to say that. Socrates, and you know that a square figure has these four lines equal. Yes. And now, and these lines which I have drawn through the middle of the square are also equal. Right? So here we're really imagining, you know, what's being described is the situation where a, a, a drawing, a diagram, is being construed as they go along. Okay? And then, so, yes, the Socrates may be on that side, and, and it continues. So, so I just... All I needed now was this bit where uh, you know, it looks like the, the drawing is being made as the dialogue progresses. Okay? So I'm sure you're familiar with how, how this ends. But. Okay, so that's for mathematics. I'm also equally interested in what's happening in the logic side of things. I'm not going to talk that much about logic. Uh, mostly I'll talk about mathematics, but of course, you know, given this audience and the, the theme of the conference, these, these two things are closely connected. So here I give you Aristotle on the definition of the syllogism from the prime analytics. And the, the, part, the, 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 the numbered parts there, uh, I'll just quickly, I'll just throw it at you and claim without spending too much time on it, that there is a very strong dialogical component to this definition. So he says, a syllogism is an argument in which some things having been posited, some things having been stated, speech act, Something other than what, was, what has been laid down, and then the other is really important because this motivates the claim that uh, Aristotle's conception of the syllogism is, ir is, is, is irreflexive, right? so it's an irreflexive logical system. Then, 
Three, results by necessity, right? So that's the necessity clause. And fourth, because these things are so. And this because these things are so are of, is often interpreted as a requirement of relevance. Right? So that's the very fact that things are, as the premises say, that makes the conclusion also be the case. So there has to be some sort of relevance connection. So just throwing it out there, you know, I, I take all this to be a very clear uh, dialogical inspiration, and then there's this whole story to be told on how syllogistic has developed in the prior analytics is a response, is a technical response to needs that arise in the context of dialectical disputations where you need to know when an argument is going to be valid or not. So I'll, I'll just part these issues aside. So quick, some quick comments on the connection between logic and mathematics in ancient Greece. So this, was, this is an issue that was developed, discussed quite extensively some decades ago among classicists. So there was this guy called Zabo who claimed that actually the notion of uh, mathematical proof of, uh, of necessary truth, deduction and mathematical proof came from philosophy, came from logical philosophy. Uh, and then there was this other guy, Knorr, who said it was the other way around. No, the notion in, that you find in Plato, in Aristotle, came from mathematics. Okay, so what's the uh, direction of influence here? So, uh, and then I also want to know that Revier Metz, in the book that I was telling about the shaping of deduction, <coughs> He claims that the schematic ladders that are used in the prior analytics were inspired by the, the practice of using ladders to name points in a geometric figure. Okay? And then, of course, this would be an, the idea that actually the mathematics has some sort of uh, prior, temporal priority, or perhaps even conceptual priority. And, but this, for us, in any case, means that there is, if that's the case, if that's true, then there is, historically speaking, a very cl close connection between our use of schematic ladders in logic and diagrams. Okay? So these are were originally points in diagrams. But we may never find out how exactly things happen, where, you know, with, you know, with mathematics that influenced philosophy or the other way around, simply because they don't have the sources. So it, it's just one of those things, you know, we just have to live with it and move on with our lives, knowing that we'll never know for sure what exactly happened there. Okay. So here's uh, the part on proof on dialogical notion. And I, I do spend quite some time, look, you know, choosing these little pictures that I use. <laughs> And I, don't, I wonder if anyone knows who this person is. So this woman is called Alice, Alice Cheng. She's the first uh, uh, chair of the Department of Mathematics in Princeton who happens to be a woman. And I just thought it was a very, very nice picture how she's really talking to this other person and pointing at the symbols. So really kind of uh, in, the picture embodies a lot of the things that I care about including the position of women in mathematics. <laughs> okay, so now, now is really the, the kind of the core story that you know, I'll be trying to convince you of this idea that the best way to think of, a, of mathematical proof is from a dialogical perspective. And over lunch, I was already talking with my doctor father, Joran Sumo, who's here, and he was already not convinced. So this is going to be fun, <laughs> you know? Let's see, let's see if, uh, you know, if he's a little bit more convinced after this. <laughs> Okay, so my starting point is what you could call a functionalist question, right? I, this, these are the kinds of questions I ask myself. You know, these are the kinds of questions I care about. What's the point of deductive proofs? What's the point in engaging in the practice of deductive proofs? These are the kinds of questions I care about. You know, I, I like the human factor in mathematics. I, you know, I want to know why, why it is that people do things the way they do in mathematics as well as, well, as, well as, as, well as elsewhere. And that, this is a, well, so what are they good for? This is a question that was discussed a few years ago by, ne by Rav in this very influential paper, now why do we prove theorems? And uh, my claim is that the main function of the deductive proof is to produce explanatory persuasion in an interlocutor. And that's something that Robin Hirsch has also said, uh, for those of you familiar with all these debates, the maverick tradition and mathematics, etc. So the point is that I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the things they say, but I'm not at all satisfied with the way they argue for it. So I, I think, you know, I, I, I must do better. I, I'm in agreement with them, but I, you know, I think to establish the positions that they want to establish, more work needs to be done. So explanatory persuasion and an interlocutor. So my idea is that a good proof is the one that convinces a fair but tough opponent 
of the truth of a given statement, given the tr presumed truth of the premises, that could be also hypothetical truth of the premises if you want us to call it that way, and if that's the case, right, so it's about explanatory persuasion in our interlocutor, that means that proof is an inherently multi-agent dialogical notion. Right? And of course you might say, well, but no, look, you know, if I'm a mathematician, it might well be that I wake up one day and I decide to write down this proof all for myself. Right? In what way is this multi-agent? Well, my claim is that in that case, the mathematician is playing both roles, is both being both the sender and the receiver, so to say. Okay? But so we'll get to that later on. So here now comes the kind of the rational reconstruction. What kind of dialogues are these? Right? Are they, mathematical proofs are not just dialogues like you know when you go by groceries, you know, downstairs. That's not it. It's a bit more complicated than that. It's like these are dialogues for a niche of specialists. These are very specific kinds of dialogues. So these are, I call them semi-adversarial dialogues of this very special kind. Two participants who have opposite goals, and that's why it's at least to some extent adversarial. Uh, one is the prover. The prover wants to establish the conclusion. And then there's the skeptic. The skeptic wants to block the establishment of the conclusion. But not at all costs. Right? The skeptic is, fit, is tough but fair. So the dialogue starts with Prover asking skeptic to grant certain premises. Right? And you might want to think that Prover is also committing to these premises, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's really more about getting skeptic to agree with these premises because the whole point is that if skeptic grants these premises, then skeptic will be forced to grant the conclusion. Uh, so then uh, once these premises are on the table and have been granted by skeptic, then Prover puts forward further statements which Prover claims follow necessarily from what Skeptic has already granted. And of course you can have auxiliary premises as you go along as long as you mark them clearly as something that you're asking, you know, something additional, an additional commitment on the part of Prover. And Skeptic, what, is, what can Skeptic do? Skeptic has two basic moves in my story. One is the to present a counterexample, that's the classical one, so to say, right? So how do you show that a particular inferential step is not valid? By, you know, presenting a situation where the premises are the case and the conclusion is not. It can be also, uh, you know, intermediate, intermediary steps. It doesn't have to be to the global premises and the global group. And skeptic has another move, and that's kind of rude to me in a way, you know, so I mean, you don't really see this in other uh, game theoretical, dialogical conceptions of logic, which is to ask for further clarification. So a skeptic can say, where does this follow? Now, with this step, you're going too fast here. What's the ground for you to go from here to there? Okay? So a skeptic can ask for clarification. So then there are three uh, features of the of deductive proofs that I will isolate, and I'll tell you that all of them, all three of them have, you know, are best understood as dialogical. The first one is necessary, necessary truth preservation which is the hallmark of a deductive, deductive discourse. So the idea here is a very familiar idea. This, you know, probably all of you have heard this before. It's the idea to think about a deductive proof, a valid deductive proof, in terms of a winning strategy. It's a winning strategy for prover. What this means is that no matter what skeptic is, is going to do as a counter movement, as a counter move, it's not going to invalidate the strategy is not going to, to invalidate the specific inferential steps in Prover's uh, strategy because each of them is indefeasible in this way. So no matter what external information, no matter nothing is going to invalidate the, each of the steps if indeed it is a, a valid proof, if indeed it is a winning strategy for Prover. And so this is how I think it's a very natural idea which is already, a, you know, in Lawrence and, and, and in uh, Entica and many other people, the idea that necessary to preservation can be accounted for in terms of indefeasibility with the concept of a winning strategy. As I said, this is, a, this is an idea that's been in the air for decades. It's not new to me. What is, a, well, I wouldn't say new to me, but at least something that I'm making explicit, which I think these other accounts have not made sufficiently explicit, is the idea of perspicuity and the importance of perspicuity for a mathematical proof and which I interpret as a didactic, you could call it a didactic feature. Right? Why is it that proofs have to be perspicuous? That's, a, I think, a term that Wittgenstein in the case uses about proofs, so they have to be perspicuous. Well, again, uh, uh, absence of counterexamples, which you, know, you might think is the whole story, is not the whole story. Right? 
because each of the steps, there is also the desideratum and a mathematical proof that each of the steps be as clear as possible individually. Why is that? Why, why this desideratum? What's the point of this? Each of the steps being, being compelling and persuasive in the, individually. Right? So there is this desideratum. I mean, this is just one that we recognize, and anyone you know, familiar with basic mathematics knows that you know, this is one way in which you can you know, uh, fail a math exam if your proof doesn't really detail the steps in a sufficiently clear way. Uh, and now I'm talking about mathematics. I'm not talking about taking you know, a formal logic course, right? because then you just apply the rules. But much before that, you know, if you're just writing down a mathematical proof, there isn't like a system of rules that tell you what you can or cannot do. And yes, there is this, this, this desideratum that each of the steps has to be sufficiently clear. And by the way, sufficiently clear depending on the audience. Can I make a question mm. now, because I think it's important at this point. Are you excluding proofs by reduction of children and by vacuity? So reduction proofs is exactly what I talked about here in, in October. <laughs> Sorry, I don't exclude. I find I, I no, no, no. I find them problematic, uh, but I, I think the best way to make sense of is precisely from a biological perspective. We can talk about it. Anyway, so the point here on the perspicuity uh, part of the story is that purely adversarial considerations cannot explain this feature. Cannot explain the desideratum of each step being individually perspicuous, because if it was just a matter of prove or beating skeptic, right? Uh, it would be more advantageous to make big leaps, big inferential leaps. There would be no counterexamples to them, right? And it would be much more difficult for a skeptic to counter them if they're big leaps. And this is a point that was made to me uh, in Bristol. I don't know, you know, were you there with me? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you were there, right? And somebody made this point and said, hey, but you know, if if all there is is you know the, these adversarial considerations, the best proofs are the ones that go premises conclusion, right? Basics of number theory from us last year. Here's my proof. You don't have a counterexample to that, do you? That's not how it works. Right? Clearly, we're failing to capture something very essential about the notion of proof if we don't take that into account. And so this is why there's this move for a skeptic. Why does this fall? Okay, the skeptic can ask for further clarification. Okay, third uh, third component of the notion of proof that I want to isolate, which is again related to the to the theme of this conference, is the idea of accepting premises or assuming hypotheses, and that's going to be very important uh, for my story later on. Right? One of the key concepts uh, in uh, key concepts of the uh, one of the key components of deductive validity is the idea that you need to dissociate truth and belief from validity. Right? That you can draw conclusions from uh, uh, premises that are false or unknown to you, whether they're true or not, or even that you know to be false. Of course, Frege didn't like that. We know that. But almost everybody else thinks that that's okay, you can do that. And uh, so, th and this may seem obvious, but cognitively this is not obvious at all. And the little work that's been done on reasoning with people with uh, low levels of schooling shows that they find it very strange to, why, what do you mean, why do I have to reason with this, this, inf this information that I, that I have no access to? Okay? So this is an important thing. Uh, so you have to put your beliefs aside and reason with what you're given. Yeah. Here are the premises. What, what conclusions do you draw? Forget about what you think of the premises in the first place. And here's a, a, sort of like this, uh, just to illustrate why this is not obvious. I just, it's a part of a very basic grammar school education. So for example, imagine this, like, you know, this kid, uh, training and basic arithmetic and then the problem given to the kid is uh, so your mother told you to go to the supermarket and to buy 20 apples and 30 and 30 pears how many fruits did you buy and can you imagine the kid saying but that makes no sense nobody buys 20 apples and 30 <laughs> pears in one go I, I can't reason with that right one of the things that comes with very basic schooling is just to accept the parameters of the problem and reason with what you're given I forget about what you think about that. Okay? And I think that this idea of assuming hypothesis is something that makes very good sense, very natural in a dialogical setting. Right? Participants can agree to grant the premises for the sake of the argument. Right? I mean, that's the, the usual phrase, for the sake of the argument. And this is, a, again, one of my, the main inspirations for this model that I'm developing is Aristotle, and in particular in the topics. 
and then so the, the, these dialectical disputations that people had, and that's exactly what, what they're doing. He says, you know, one of, one of the kinds of dialectical disputations that he wants to talk about and the one he's most interested in, the one for inquiry, he says what we do we, is we suppose something and we see what follows from it. Okay? Doesn't matter if, you know, if it really is the case or not. We're supposing and we we'll see what follows. Okay? And another thing that can happen in a dialogical setting is that a participant can draw the consequences of her opponent's beliefs and commitments. And now I come to your question. This is my answer to the reduction proof. What you do is I, you know, I get you to grant A, right? And then I show that from A something absurd follows. And then I say, therefore not A. You should not have granted A in the first place. But all the time what I was doing is, is reasoning on the consequences of your commitment, not mine. Okay? So that's, that's I think, is something very natural to think from a dialogical perspective. Okay, so, so far so good, so far we're with dialogues, but then you might say to me, but hey, you know, when I'm doing my, you know, most mathematical proofs, around, they don't look like dialogues at all. So why are you saying that they're dialogues? Well, what happened? What happened is what I call the internalization of one of the players of skeptic. So skeptic has been internalized into the method itself. Remember that the job of skeptic is to look for counterexamples and to make sure that the argumentation is perspicuous, right? that the argumentation is clear, it's convincing. So these two features have been integrated into the very method of you know, formulating a mathematical proof, and this is why I call it, uh, I say that skeptic, skeptic himself has been internalized, because the main roles of skeptic, skeptic have been internalized into the math. So the strategic goal, remember I, I, <coughs> I, I uh, presented the idea of necessary truth preservation as a strategic desideratum, it's a way to win the game. So this strategic goal of formulating the feasible arguments to win the game becomes a constitutive feature of the method itself, because now uh, every single step in a deductively valid mathematical proof has to be necessarily truth preserving. Okay? This is a necessary condition, not perhaps not sufficient, that's a different story, but in any case a necessary condition. And then the didactic goal of convincing, argue, uh, formulating convincing arguments becomes this idea, idea of the explanatory proof, which in the limit would be gap-free, if you want to call it that. Some people like this phrase, I know Joram doesn't like it. Anyway, and then there's also, because it didn't fit the slides, I didn't put it, but I mean the making hypothesis thing is also something that uh, that uh, is absorbed into the method because it is possible to make hypothesis when formulating a proof, but I'll talk much more about it later, so I'll park that aside. Uh, but that's the one I'll focus more um, on the most in the, second, the third part of the talk. So this is why I say that a deductive proof a dedu is, a dis uh, is and is not a dialogue. So first of all, it is a discourse aimed at a putative audience. It always is a discourse. You might think that you know maybe somebody would just for fun write down mathematical proof just to, you know for him or herself, but even then there's me as the audience. But in a wide majority of cases, that's somebody, something that a friend of mine many years ago told me, uh, a Brazilian friend of Petrucci, you know, as he said, you know, there are only three reasons why you prove theorems. One, because you want to prove, you know, publish the article. Two, because you know you need to finish your thesis. <laughs> and, and the third is if you're not sure. But well, this is very rare. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he said this to me many years ago, and so it always stayed with me, and in a sense, that's exactly what I'm doing. Okay. So the proof, proofs retain these dialogical features, persuasiveness, necessary truth preservation, and the policies for premise acceptance and for making hypotheses. I take all these to be, uh, to have uh, dialogical origins to be inherently dialogical, but the proof is no longer a dialogue properly speaking because one of the participants, skeptic, has been silenced by internalization. So this sounds very dramatic, it's been silenced. I, I don't mean it in this like, politically charged way, but still, it, it was observed by the method, and that's why it looks like it's not a dialogue when it actually is, or at least to some extent it still is a dialogue. Okay? Fine, so now I'm going to talk about what I was asked to talk about when I came. So my work in uh, on formal languages, and here I had to, sorry for the shameless self-promotion, but here's the book, which came out already two and a half years ago, and now it's on paperback. So since last year, you can actually... Buy it. Yeah. 
If nothing else, for the beautiful There is cover. a reduction for the participant to confirm. That's right. <laughs> Use promotion code, code whatever. But uh, look at the, the, the cover. Yes, it is. But I showed you before. You need that. But you would recognize anyway. Jan from Plato showed it to me. That's right. But I showed you the cover of the. No, I think. No. I should have. Anyway, but of course, this was a manuscript of Gensu's dissertation, which was discovered by Jan von Plato maybe some 10 years ago by now. Absolutely brilliant, and this is what's in here, is his proof of normalization, which didn't make it to the printed version, and was rediscovered by Pravitz 30 years later. And it's one of those things that's just really crazy. And the proof, Gensu knew the proof, but for whatever reason, he didn't think it was sufficiently interesting for it to go in a final uh, typeset version of the dissertation. I don't know why, but uh, I just thought it was just such a beautiful thing that it had to be the cover of the book. Okay, so um, let's start with the previous part, with the orality story, right? So that I remember the quote from the beginning by Rabbi Arnaz who said, well, uh, Rabbi Arnaz says that there is this interesting passage from the purely oral proofs such as the, the mean of proof, right, of the, how you double the, the area of, uh, how you double the, the square. From that to written proofs, and this step already took place in ancient Greece. So uh, the, the oral proofs would be something like what we saw with the mean. They are produced on the spot for an audience of potential skeptics, and I qualify here this idea of potential skeptics because, say, in a classroom situation, you can't really say that the students are really playing skeptic because there's this asymmetry, right? And I think uh, it's Hirsch who says somewhere, well, you know, uh, students are not, uh, not very good skeptics because they're very easy to convince, right? They just, you know, you in your position of authority, you say, look, this is the case. And they're like, okay, who am I to, you know, question? Of course, some students are, right? And there are these stories of when Tarski was teaching and Dennis Scott was in the back and then he was all the time saying that it was all wrong, at least I think that's what I read in the, in the Tarski bio by the Fetelmans. But most students are, you know, are more tame than that. Anyway, so this, this will be the oral situation. And in the oral situation, there's sim simultaneous feedback from the audience. Right? So the, in theory, skeptic, there is not silence. Skeptic can really kind of you know, say, hey, wait, I don't see this. Why, why is this? Why, is, why are you saying that? And this will have varying levels of granularity depending on the audience. Right? So this is an important thing. I, an important component of my dialogical story, which is that the level of granularity of a mathematical proof will always be in function of the intended audience. So a, a proof that is intended to be sent for publication in a professional mathematical journal will really be a proof sketch. Right? The details are not worked out. There's just all, you know, the proof goes like this. And the idea is like, you know, if you want to do it, you can do it. But you know, I don't need to fill in the details. But if you're a lecturer in a first year, you know, intro to calculus or whatever, you really need to spell out the proof in detail because you're actually teaching your students the game of proving things in mathematics. And in, this, in these cases also, the diagrams are construed as the proof progresses, as again in the Mino story, and typically there'll be some writing involved, right? I mean, we're, we're trained in such a way now that, you know, even when you're talking through a proof and you're presenting a proof orally, typically you you're using the whiteboard or the blackboard, like that picture from uh, that I had at the beginning of Alice, Alice Shen. Written proofs, on the other hand, and now I'm thinking of the ones that you see, say, in a journal, right, in a mathematical journal or in a textbook. They, during the produce, production of the proof, the audience is the internalized skeptic during the production. Right? There's always some sort of intended audience in mind that the person who's formulating the proof has. But that means that there's no simultaneous feedback. Right? There's no like this inter the ping pong, the interaction that you would have with an actual skeptic in front of you. So the, the, then again, the idea of the granularity, so the granularity of the proof will be defined in function of the intended audience, because the intended audience will only see the end product, either in a textbook or in a professional mathematical journal. And diagrams, if they're present, which is not always the case, are also only presented in the final form. Right? So the, 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 the audience, the receiver, doesn't get to see the, uh, unless, of course, you can do it step by step, and I guess it, uh, that's done sometimes too, right? First you do this, first you, then you do that, and you, you just describe you know, successive diagrams which then tell you about the different stages of the construction. 
But it's much more static. Right? The idea is that it's all there in front of you. So that's from oral to written. Now, what about the passage from the informal written proofs to the formal proofs? Right? So I'm thinking of these two different stages here of transformation. One from oral to written, and now from written, informal and written, to the formal proofs that we know and love. Of course, here yeah, I could never do justice to the huge literature on the relationships between informal and formal proofs. There's just no end to it. People keep writing about it. Just uh, recently I was handling, a, as an editor of the Review of Symbolic Logic, I was handling a paper by Alan Ware, who's going back to this. Of course, those who know Alan are not surprised that he's still talking about this. But I mean, this remains a, a topic for discussion. And uh, a formal proof is relative to a formal system. This is something that is just something we need to live with. I and mean, Johan von Benjamin, for example, doesn't like that. He calls it system imprisonment. He says you're stuck in the, you know. He says, you know, mathematicians don't want to know what's provable inside PA with first order logic as the background logic. They want to know, you know, what's provable of arithmetic. So that's, there is the system relativity. But actually, an informal proof, in a sense, is also relative. It's relative to the passive rules of the game shared by the participants in question. Right? So there's a sense in which there's also a, a relativity there. It's just that it's less explicit than in the case of formal systems. And then the, the general claim uh, that I've defended in the book is that formal proofs viewed in this way with the you know, use of clever notation become themselves diagrams which one manipulates hands-on. That's also something that Valeria has worked on. I will talk about it, I suppose, after me. So, and so now I'm going to spend a little bit of time trying to convince you of this. And I'll briefly talk about Frege, I'll talk very, even more briefly about the axiomatic method, and I'll spend a little bit more time on Gensley and Yakovsky. And I want to say that, uh, you know, it's a little bit scary to be talking about Frege here, because two of the people who have shaped my thinking about Frege most are here, Joram Sunom and Wilfried Sieg. So it's a bit scary. I hope that, you know, you won't be uh, disappointed. <laughs> and yet, and actually because I'll be talking about the work of Daniel Macbeth uh, in, in relation to Frege, and I know that it's everything but unanimously accepted. And yet I find it very compelling. Okay, so first, what is diagrammatic reasoning? Right? So for maybe for some people that I don't really need to, to, to address it. Do you have issues like that too? Oh, uh, you go first. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, no, it's just at first, this is a, when I made this slide and I sent it to the people in my research group and all of them were like, but we don't know what you mean by diagrammatic reasoning. Okay, I'll put the slide on that. So reason, uh, diagrammatic reasoning will be something like reasoning by means of visual representation as opposed to linguistic representation, but what does that even mean, right? It's not really helping much. Uh, another attempt, maybe going a little bit further, is the idea of the relevance of the spatial relations between the elements of the representation. That, that, that's relevant, whereas in the so-called purely linguistic reasoning, that's not as relevant, or perhaps not relevant at all. And then, at least on some versions of what diagrammatic reasoning is, the, the, there is on a, the focus on the concreteness of the pictures themselves for you to carry out the operations of transformation. Not everybody agrees on this, by the way. Mm. But I'm very much in this camp, and I'm like a, one of these embodied and embedded extended cognition people. So that's why for me, you know, that's what I is. They're like, you know, you operate on them hands on. And uh, uh, just to clarify, to illustrate this a bit further, I don't have the time. Not much, huh? But uh, yeah, I'll ah, okay, okay. And I'll spend a little bit of time on this because these are very interesting results. So this is a uh, experimental work done by uh, Landy and Ghost. So David Landy is a cognitive scientist, and also is, was a supervisor in Indiana. And they've done a lot of experiments, you know, to probe. The, uh, the, the role of, of the concreteness of the, the physical appearance of notation for reason. So here's one, one of their experiments. The task was very simple, just to love, solve linear equations with one variable, nothing, nothing fancy at all, but these equations were displayed against a moving background. Okay? So the background was on a computer screen and then the background was moving either in one direction or the other. And the goal was to probe the level of involvement of processes that are normally related to motion. Okay. So the, the, the prediction is that if there is a what they call symbol pushing component 
uh, in how people reason with these formulae, then the direction of the background movement would have an impact on how people actually uh, solve those equations. <coughs> sorry. So, and of course, if there is no involvement of like of the sensory motor processing, then it doesn't matter. The moving background is completely irrelevant for how you're going to solve an equation. Right? That's that would be the idea. And the results, as they, they expected, and I'm not surprised, but uh, yeah, I guess some people might, might be, is that solving the equation was facilitated when the background motion was going in the direction of the symbolic transposition required. I'll show you in a minute what that means. And it was made more difficult if the background was going in the wrong direction. And they also, of course, tested with no background at all. Okay? They tested the three uh, no moving background. They tested the three conditions and the most, you know, the, the, the the, the situation where people found it the easiest, they did it the fastest, and with less error, was when the, the, move, the background was moving in the right direction for the transformation. So, <coughs> more concretely, so you have this super simple equation. This is what you need to do, right? I mean, according to how you learn kind of in school. You need to get this one here and move it to the other side. Of course, this is a heuristic. I mean, the, the real story is that, you know, there's one here, and then you can uh, subtract one on this side and subtract one on this side, because that's what the, an equation is. If you do the same thing on each side, you still have an equation. So, but that's, this is the, the theory, this is the story. But in practice, what people really do is they get the one here and they throw it to the other side. And indeed, if the, move, the background was moving in that direction, that was a, a facilitatory effect. If the background was moving in the wrong direction, there was no facilitation. In fact, it made it more difficult for people to solve these equations, even uh, with respect to no moving back. Okay? So I think these are the kinds of results that suggest quite strongly that there is this component of moving notate bits and facilitation around. So now about Frege. Uh, well, the starting point is the one that everybody knows, that he had the details and the um, preface of the Begriff Schrift. He says the languages of life are inadequate for scientific and mathematical discourse. They're imprecise. They let assumptions sneak in. It's a mess. It's not good. Right? Although Frege basically thought that all the theorems that mathematicians proved were basically true. Right? He wasn't questioning that. But he just wanted to isolate all the assumptions being used. And the, uh, so then he came up with the, the, the Begriffschrift notation, which some people hate, many people hate, I think. And, but now, uh, with the work of Daniel Macbeth, in any case, and I suppose other people too, it's become more and more clear that the way the notation was actually designed is not a coincidence. It's not something that's just meant to make people's lives difficult. You know, it was really, there was something about it that would make it easier to perform the transformations that are required. And so here I have from Daniel Macbeth, we can make good sense of these claims, of the claims that she's uh, uh, examining. If we read Frege's notation diagrammatically, in particular if we take that notation to have been designed to enable one to exhibit the inferentially articulated contents of concepts in a way that allows one to reason deductively on the basis of those contents. Right? So hands-on manipulation of the notation is the idea. And then, of course, uh, we know what happened afterwards. Uh, Russell and Whitehead said, oh, we love Frege. We think this is such a great, great program. We're really going to do this. First, there's this little problem with the inconsistency. We're going to work on that. We're going to fix that. But also, just for convenience, instead of using Frege's notation, we're going to use Piano's notation. But it's immaterial. It could just as well have been Frege's notation. Well, it's not immaterial. And that's the whole, the, the upshot of the story. So this is the kind of thing, this I'm taking just from Danielle's paper and the, the kind of transformations that, he, that she talks about that are done very, in a very graphic way. So, okay, the axiomatic method. Here I'm deeply, deeply indebted to Mary Craig here. Who, uh, yeah, yeah. Every time I have to, I say this every time I talk about this paper and for once he's here, so I can make him <laughs> really embarrassed. It's fun. I, I've done that before, I think, too, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so this is great, great paper by uh, Eric with Steve Odey, which really sums up everything one needs to know about the period in a way. So in the early days of formal axiomatics with Dedekind and Weble and those people, Piano, 
there was no explicit formulation of the rules of inference, right? There was the explicit formulation of the axioms, but none of the rules of inference, except, of course, for Frick. But everybody else just didn't really think that it was so important. And then the realization that it was, that this was something they needed to pay attention to, only came later when they started to realize that the desired matter properties, completeness, consistency, what we now call categoricity, these desired matter properties could not be taken for granted. They would not follow suit from well-crafted axioms, right? They needed to be proved. And to prove that, that's when you, of course, turn mathematical problems into mathematical problems, that the axiomatic method was designed to do that. Uh, but the axiomatic method leaves no room for this idea of making arbitrary assumptions and seeing what follows from that. Yeah, so the original version, the Robertian version of the axiomatic method doesn't leave room for that. And that might be a problem. I mean, at least for some people this, this can be a problem. And indeed, this was a problem for Lukacevic in 26, who otherwise loves the axiomatic method. Right? So he has this whole formalization of Aristotle's syllogistic, which is a disaster. It's all axiomatic, and that's exactly what's wrong with it, among other things. Anyway, but he set up this seminar question, right? This question said, well, you know, let's divide, develop a logical theory that does justice to this idea of making assumptions, right? So, but as we do in mathematical reasoning. So he really thought that, you know, this is something that mathematicians do when they're proving things, and they assume things, they make, you know, uh, hypotheses. And his student, Tchaikovsky, then proposed th two theories to address Lukacevic's challenge. And here I'm following this very nice paper by Jeff Politi. In fact, there are many papers by Jeff Politi all around the same time. They all overlap with each other on the history of natural deduction. But they're all good, so you can read whichever one you want. But this one, uh, so he's describing the two methods that were developed by Tchaikovsky. One method is graphical in nature, drawing boxes or rectangles around portions of a proof. The other method amounts to tracking the assumptions and their consequences by means of a bookkeeping notation alongside the sequence of formulae that constitutes a proof. And so here's the box method, which is visual, so you get to see what it looks like. You can see it. Yeah. Right? So very great, like the, 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 the challenge is how to graphically represent the idea of making assumptions. Okay? And why is this a problem? Because making assumptions, I claim, is something that's typically discursive, and not only discursive, but also typically dialogical. And now we have the challenge of how to render this into graphical form. Okay? So this was one of the answers. More or less at the same time as we know, but much more known to us now, Genson was working on, on you know, with similar ideas and uh, developed, as we know, these two systems, natural deduction and the sequence calculus. And what he says about to motivate this, the development of natural deduction is absolutely perfect. My starting point was this. The formalization of logical deduction, especially as it has been developed by Frege, Russell, and Hilbert, but I think Frege is not, doesn't deserve to be in this list here, but <laughs> Russell and Hilbert, I guess, is rather far removed from the forms of deduction used in practice in mathematical proofs. My emphasis. Considerable formal advantages are achieved every time. In contrast, I intend first to set up a formal system which comes as close as possible to actual reasoning. Now he left a mathematics out, right? but I think this is the way you have to think about it. The result was a calculus of natural deduction. Right? And I'm, I'm sure all of you have been confronted by a student at some point or another desperate to know what is natural about natural deduction. Well, na what is natural about natural deduction is that, is that it's intended to capture mathematical reasoning, as he himself says, except that in the second, in the second paragraph that somehow you know, is left out. He continues, the essential difference between natural deduction derivations and derivations in the system of Russell, Hilbert, and Heiting is the following. In the latter systems, true formulae are derived from a sequence of basic, basic logical formulae, by means of a few forms of inference. Natural deduction, however, does not, in general, start from basic logic, logical propositions, but rather from assumptions to which logical deductions are applied. By means of a later inference, the result is then made again independent of the assumption. I mean, that's, of course, you know, the ABC, right, of uh, what, how things work in natural deduction, but it's really nice to see you know, what, it, what, what motivated Genson to uh, develop these, these concepts and then give them concreteness in his logical notation. 
So basically, my claim, which I don't think is controversial at all, but deserves to be said anyway, is that the goal, Gens's goal with natural deduction was to recapture the discursive flow of informal proofs in mathematics. It's to, it was to come up with a logical system that would be clo more closely related to what informal proofs in mathematics really look like than the axiomatic method. And in particular, he wanted to capture this speech act of making assumptions, which he and, and almost everybody agrees is fundamental to mathematical practice. And I claim that this speech act of making assumptions is not only uh, inherently discursive, that's fine, everybody would agree with that, but I'm also saying it's inherently dialogical. It makes most sense in a situation where I'm talking to an interlocutor and I say, uh, do you agree with this? What about this? Should we, you know, can we reason with this? And uh, then you move on. Or you, uh, or you just get the opponent to grant the, the assumption and you don't commit to it yourself. Okay? So there, they, this, I claim that this is a very, uh, it has a very strong dialogical component. And then there is the question, which was one that uh, Gensen was uh, dealing with, and Tarkovsky as well, how best to capture this typically dialogical phenomenon, oral phenomenon, in writing. Graphical form, and this is why you know exactly in the question of how to capture the idea of making an assumption in a logical formal system, orality, writing, and di diagrams come together. Right? So the, 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 all the thing, all these different things converge into this problem, and this gives rise to high, these hybrid entities, formal proofs. Right? And I have claimed that you know what is diagrammatic about it is the proof itself that becomes a diagram. So my conclusions, there I talked about two crucial transformations, two crucial uh, steps. One is from proofs as oral arguments that are clearly dialogical to proofs in text, as text, which we would call informal proofs in mathematics. And then I talked about how to go from these written informal proofs to formal proofs in, in inside formal systems. And of course, I'm saying that these are three categories, but there may well be all kinds of hybrid in between, in between cases. I don't want to say that these three categories are neatly separated from each other. But there is this idea of the passage from one to the other. And I claim that diagrammatic reasoning is present on all three levels, but in very different ways. So in the first way, the, in the oral case, uh, the oral proofs, the, the, in oral proofs, the diagrams enlisted visual engagement. And again, in the Mino case, it's absolutely fundamental for the boy, the slave, to see what's going on, that he sees the drawing and literally sees why that procedure doubles the area of the square. Okay? And this is produced as the proof proceeds. In written informal proofs, you know, as you have in mathematical journals or in textbooks, what, what you have is typically only the final result. And this is why we have all that, also that historical problem that I was telling you about, that we don't know what the original diagrams were of, of say, Euclid's elements. And finally, formal proofs themselves can be viewed as diagrams if you, know, if you go along with this idea that what you do is, it, to a great extent at least, with the notation is really to operate hands-on and move bits and pieces of the notation here and there, and you know, literally do what uh, Landy calls symbol pushing. And so in that sense, it's a yet a different way in which the notion of diagrams becomes important for the notion of mathematical. Thank you. Thank you. I refer to turn. 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 Uh, this is very <laughs> big. Isn't first. If we know any first. example of a diagrammatic proof which escapes from plain geometry. I mean, in, in the following sense, why all diagrams have to be drawn on a plane? Mm -hmm. Right? You're pushing things here and there. Uh, it could be three dimensions. Kind of yeah, I mean, yeah. What kind of a dimension, what kind of world dimension would do? Do you have an example? Well, so I mean, it's, I think to a great extent it's just a matter of what's practical. And, and, and you know, you know the, the HMND Barawise system, right? It's supposed to be with blocks. So it's supposed to be three-dimensional, and you can do all kinds of proofs with these three dimensions. And the other thing is also that but the person... Are they necessary, three dimensions? Right? But are they necessary, one dimension or two dimensions? I mean, it becomes very difficult to answer this question. But what does it mean for something to be necessary? Is it like indispensable that the proof would not go through? 
I find this is a difficult question. I'm the one that right now I definitely don't, don't have the time to do it. In any case, what I'm committing to here is that they play a very important part in the world. Almost perhaps indispensable in the sense of the persuasiveness component. If you really want to get your audience to see what's going on, to explain to them what's going on, diagrams can play this absolutely fundamental role or other forms of concreteness. Right? And I, I also want to mention briefly uh, the work by the late Lawrence Goldstein, who died recently, very sadly. And he developed these systems to teach logic to people who are blind. And then he had these uh, devices that are three-dimensional, and then he proves things about syllogistic on the basis of transformations that you do with the apparatus, three-dimensional. So in theory, there's nothing that determines that it has to be two-dimensional. But for the sake of you know, convenience, because papers are cheaper. <laughs> Uh, I'll say more during my talk, but Great. I just have two comments. One uh, is just uh, on your last slide. The, I mean, from what you say, you are saying much more what, about what diagrammatic reasoning is, in fact, than the slide in which you give uh, yeah, yeah, about the, the first so one. Yeah. I think that here it's clear that you're thinking of something much more, not, not only in terms of visual versus linguistic, but you're thinking more of the kind of Action yeah, yeah, so it's from all so, the process. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so the first slide was really trying to be exactly. neutral, presenting yeah. a definition, but. Um, so I'm happy about it because that's what I'm trying to try to pinpoint. But then I have another um, comment on your use of orality uh, because I think it's kind of dangerous in the sense that you're thinking of orality in a written culture. Uh, and that, that's uh, something, uh, I think, crucial because also in the kind of dialogical uh, activities that you're thinking about, there is also some kind of uh, writing that might be a reference. For example, in the case of the Nino, you talk about drawing a figure. So there is this possibility of drawing a figure. And so and, and just, uh, uh, I just want to, to underline that, in fact, we are, we are talking in a orality in a written culture and non-orality in an oral culture so that might have okay. other kinds of... Uh, so just first on the first point, I was just talking about this stuff with Kathy Legg, who works on purse. And she doesn't uh, agree with this idea of hands-on manipulation. For her, it's, you know, visual reason is very important, but it's some sort of abstract visual reason. I don't know what she means by that. Yeah. But yeah. That's surprising. I know. I was surprised too. But just to say that you can have people who are fans of diagrammatic reasoning and yet not be the embodied and better extended kind of person that I am. Okay? <laughs> For the second one, um, actually the slave in the Mino is supposed not to know how to write. For what is left, right? But so I, I don't know to what I mean, of course you're right that it's orality in a culture that has devices for writing, right? But of course in, a, in, a, in illiterate cultures, presumably, again that's an empirical question to be studied by anthropologists, but presumably they do make use of visual uh, devices uh, of, of sorts, I, I don't know, I mean, I'm mean, i speculating here. Right? It's not that you need to be a, in a literate culture to be uh, able to make use of visual uh, elicitation. And so I think that the, the drawing of the figure there, of course Plato is really playing cheap there. Right? I mean, he has this idea that you know all knowledge is already there, you know, all you need to do is to remember, and of course there's a whole theory behind that. A very uh, dubious one of that, but uh, so that's why it's important for him that the slave. The only thing that it, that he asks is, does he speak Greek? Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. Yeah, he does. Ah, okay. But in theory, it's a not a, it's not a literal person, and yet he can see what's going on with the picture. But yes, I agree with you that you know, even the kind of morality that I'm talking about is already very much contaminated, if you want to call it that way, by writing. Which is good. I mean, thinking of your conclusions. That yeah, 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 it's not a problem. problem. I mean, it's not a problem. It's just that uh, not. It's better not to. I, I would suggest not to go too much into the oral part of it. Or yeah, but I do want to go very much into the oral part of it because I think this is really, you know, uh, even if it's embedded in a culture of literacy, the orality is doing something that the literacy by itself cannot do. And there's the, the you know, the, the confrontation between the two people, the online thing of. You know, when things unfold as they go along, and that I really want to capture. That, that's that's the that's the the one of more. Yeah, one of the things that matter most to me is exactly that: is the is the interaction. You wanted to react to that? Well, just to the general question. Uh, 
what you're talking about is world in a, in a morality and written culture. There is this um, uh, much discussed theory that the Homeric ethics Good. developed in a Very purely good. oral, Very good. Uh, purely oral setting in the world written down at a late Very good, at, yes. at a late stage, and that suggests a possible line of research, and you might know whether it's been pursued, yes. whether anything that we would count as mathematics uh, uh, existed in uh, the, the pre yeah pre yeah uh, the cultural and cultural environments. Yes, this is great. So uh, definitely, uh, so apparently the, the Homeric tradition is really the, the reason why it's been preserved so well is because people are learning all those long, long uh, verses by heart because they couldn't read. Right? That's exactly the reason why they needed it to be so beautiful and for it to sound so nice because they would they would remember it better. And uh, so that's that's really great. And also the other thing is you ask you can ask this would be very difficult to establish because it's so long ago and the sources are obviously written already right so for mathematics and uh, so there's a really a problem with the sources of very very early mathematics. But I think it's worth thinking about. Uh, cultures that are illiterate, but where some sort of trading goes on, for example, and you might think of like you know to some very you know, very basic mathematics, if you want to call that, perhaps not at the level of proof, but there is something like you know uh, 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 counting and doing basic arithmetic that's this dissociated from writing in a way in, in every way. So that's that's just also I think something that might be pursued in this line. But thank you very much for reminding me that the Homeric tradition might very well have been purely oral, and that's a very nice, uh, very nice hypothesis. Yeah. Marco. Yes. So uh, in, in fact, there is not too much that I am against, but I have to against something because uh, because otherwise it's not you, design, right? Of I'll be disappointed. But no, my, my point is simply that all of what you say. Is seem to me strongly, uh, if not determined, at least suggested, but one of your starting points. That is the starting point of looking at the proof as an argument that is made to convince yeah. someone of, of, of ourselves. Or, of course, this one of the functions of the proof has yes. have and add. But I'm not sure that overall in modern mathematics is the main uh, purpose of proofs. Uh, proof, proofs are uh, very often, and uh, uh, you made a, a, a remark about that, that also during your talk, uh, are very often uh, drawn in order to establish connection uh -huh. between uh, truth. Areas. So it, the, the, the purpose of the truth is to understand what rests on what. So if you regard the proofs in this way, uh, and a lot of proofs in mathematics are uh, to be regarded in this way, I think, when, example, when you prove in piano arithmetic that, uh, I don't know, there are infinite primes, of course, this is not something that is made to convince you. But we knew that to, already. <laughs> or uh, any one of us, or even if you prove that 7 plus 5 equals 12, I suppose that is not made in order to convince you. But if you have not, if you have not be able to prove in piano arithmetic to that, so, yeah. at, at least, uh, what is com so the point is, if you regard the truth in this way as something that uh, allows you to to establish connection, I think that much, much of what you say is undermined because uh, there is no necessity in this case. No, not only no necessity, but even seem to me not really a plausibility, yeah. plausibility in looking through uh, in the biological. Yeah. So right. I think that certainly what's going on, for example, in Principia Mathematica, also. is definitely not intended to yeah. convince. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the project, the logicist project, is a different story. The proofs, and that's also that holds for Frege too. Frege is not so much concerned with a proof that's going to be convincing in this way. It's a foundational project. We want to see where it rests on. So it has this much more uh, ontological preoccupation, if you want to call it that way, right? Or epistemological, but not so much cognitive. I'm okay with that, except that I think if you look at the whole of mathematics, that's Minority. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, uh, then of course uh, there's going to uh, be. If, if I, 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 there is a, a nice passage in the commentary of uh, uh, Aquinas, 
to uh, second or first analytics. I don't remember the first or the second. This uh, 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 historical source, if you like it. It's my where, idea. Yes, where uh, uh, Aquinas uh, uh, is wondering why uh, why uh, Aristotle called analytics the analytics analytics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the answer of Aquinas is the following: in the most part of the case, we are not looking for the consequence of actions, but are looking for the actions that are. are appropriate in order to derive the consequence that, that you, you want, want to prove. And that this is what mathematics is. So, it seems to me, but this is not only a question of foundation, but this it's a question of mathematical practice. But this in is completely, cases, but mathematics. the thing that mathematics is a lot about reverse engineering, this is what yeah. I want to yeah, 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 yeah. It's dialogical. I want to dis I see what why. kind of premises do I need, do I need to, do I need, uh, say, Valeria to commit to, so that and then I will so drive her into granting my conclusion. I would rather that what we are wondering, what sort of organization our knowledge well, is. That's, that you can you can have this kind of like a, you know you can think of uh, you know mathematics. There are all the, these the, there are all these structures and there's some sort of ontology there, and then you want to see how they're connected. You know I, I can see that this picture is also alluring, but the the it's not. Me. But, but in any case, I mean, I can give you lots of case studies. No, of course, of course. Of, for example, so one thing I've uh, worked on a little bit recently is this so-called the, the purported proof of the ABC conjecture. I don't know if you've been following this, right? So there's this mathematician, this Japanese mathematician, uh, about two and a half years ago, he came up with, he claims is a proof of the ABC conjecture, which is an important conjecture number theory. Uh, it's very simple to state, and yet, like the Fermat's last theorem, very, very difficult to prove, right? And a lot of it hinges, a lot of other conje important conjectures follow from that. So it's a big deal, it's important. So the guy came up with this proof, claims is a proof, nobody understands it. Nobody understands it because he's been developing this mathematical framework all by himself for years, for 10 years or whatever. Nobody understands it. So now in the mathematical community, people, don't accept it as a proof because it's failing its function, right? Basically, we want to know, is the ABC conjecture true or not? That thing is not doing its job because it's not clear enough. It's failing in the perspicuity dimension. And this is a case from actual mathematics going on right now. But this is not the case of dialogue. This is a case of... Of course it's a case of dialogue. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the, the community don't accept it. That it's but that's a dialogue. Isn't? For me, it's, it's of course, oh, the community I mean, is are the skeptics. Dialogue. Yeah, okay, that is always dialogue. Yes, no, it's, well, it's, of it's, course, it's, because knowledge is a social phenomenon. Oh, yes. So, I mean, in that sense, then it becomes trivially the case that... But it is also, a, it's a dialogue between the, the... He's the prover, he put forward the proof. The community are explaining the skeptic, and the skeptic is not convinced. I think it's there. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of questions. Oh. Either push yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Yeah? <laughs> no, 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 no. So you can remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but, uh, who's okay, that? we have to so, have a think for one or two more questions. But wasn't it? So that, that is Gerhard. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not. We can take okay. three. We can take three. Okay, let's take three. It's going to be a bit more. I'm not sure if I've understood the uh, systematic future of your talk. Because uh, you were beginning with uh, searching, perhaps, a criterion for uh, explanatory convincing proof. And then you give the dialogue. Okay, now this is naturally first only a sufficient criterion, which is not necessary, because there are be good proofs which are found. No, and uh, secondly, it is a very idle criterion because uh, you cannot uh, have a dialogue with that persons, or you have to uh, to uh, to give rational uh, reconstruction. So I'm not sure if if, uh, if uh, how it works. Then uh, you were uh, uh, speaking about informal proofs, and you mentioned tacit knowledge. Will you say that uh, the big discussion by Henry Collins, will you say uh, apply this theory to mathematics? And in the end, you give us a, 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 a historical genesis of proof by order and by informal to the formal proof. But here too, naturally, this is, uh, if it works, this is uh, sufficient as uh, 
to explain uh, some proof. But if you look at the practice in uh, mathematical practice, this is not. Uh, yeah, but I never meant. No, uh, well, I don't know if it's helpful. Huh? But I never meant to say that all of mathematics is going through this progression. No, no, of course not. not. The, the whole point is exactly that the real proofs, the, real, the proofs that you see in mathematical journals, the proofs that mathematicians formulate, they're informal. Right? And uh, uh, well, I'm, a small. I'm not convinced uh, uh, that there are there are informal. It, there are there are written in the text. So and they are informal in a, naturally in a, in a certain sense that you have because they are already this, that you say nothing with this because there is a semantic. Naturally, semantic is informal. You have not a uh, formalized uh, mm -hmm. semantics. This, this is clear. Yeah, this is in the sense informal. You can only say this. Yeah, and all I'm saying is that the proofs that like we see, say, in a natural deduction system or, or in an axiomatic system, these are what I'm calling formal proofs, and I'm saying these okay, are not but, 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 but what is interesting is to say what, 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 what uh, can you precise this informal character of the proof and then see what is a good proof from a uh, from, uh, bad proof. Uh, yes, if you were and then I have these examples, case studies from actual mathematical practice. I just mentioned one, this ABC, the purported proof of the ABC conjecture. And I'm looking at the reaction of the mathematical community, following it quite closely with interest. And so far, it's just very interesting that people uh, really don't know what to make of it. And they're not convinced, they don't see, no, the, the proof is in limbo, is a term that I came across uh, and recently. So the people don't know if it's a proof or not. And I, you know, my, but what I'm doing, and then sometimes people say it's sociology and mathematics, so be it, is I look at actual case studies. So I'm very preoccupied exactly by actual mathematical practice. And then I look at, there's this one, and there is also, what are, what are the other ones? Well, so of course, the Wall's proof, and then there was a mistake, and then he corrected it. And then some years ago, there was this guy who claimed that he had a proof of the inconsistency of piano arithmetic and how the community reacted to that. So these are the things that I'm taking into account. So I don't see, and, and certainly I don't, I don't want to say that uh, perhaps you're worried that the conditions I'm giving here uh, don't sufficiently determine what yeah, counts no, as proof. I, so, no, I, I think that now I understood. So you give a, a, a description of a laboratory, of mathematical laboratory communities, how proofs are... Uh, yeah, what mathematicians take to be a good proof. And, and as it turns out, what well, something that's really, really important to them is that the proof <laughs> needs to be convincing okay, and explanatory. Okay. Yeah. I, you ask for a question about something. Uh, it's just a, a short follow-up on, on, on the, I think it was the first question about the 2D character of diagrams yeah. and, and whether, whether that's, why is it always 2D? And, well, I'm not sure if it always is to be. So in the philosophy of maths literature, you see people now talking all this stuff about diagrams. But for instance, if you look at non theory, for instance, uh, proofs of non theory, then you're also to make, uh, invited to, to do something mentally. But it's yes. not, it's not a dimension. Yes, you, it's actions that you do. And of course, this can all they can be formalized, but, it, but even very simple proofs in not theory, if you were going to formalize them in, 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 in a proof system, huge. they would become, um, yes, and they would become, for people, it would become almost impossible to really understand. <laughs> Which then goes on to um, confirm again the power of visualization when it comes to... Well, I'm not sure whether, this is, whether visualization is already saying a bit too much. Okay. It's, it's doing things. In doing things, mind. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, I, I understand your discussion.